What's going on guys? Jay Curtis Strickland here and you are now watching Tea and Fuckery. Before we get started, if you could do me a little favor, click on that subscribe button, click on the little bell for notifications, like this video, comment on this video, and share this video. Today on Tea and Fuckery, we have Mr. Israel Joseph the first of the Bad Brains, Fireburn, and now he's got an upcoming solo project coming out. And it's a real pleasure to have you, brother. I'm I'm really excited about this. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. Absolutely. Cool, man. So what, what you got going on? You got that, uh, you got the solo project going on. Yeah. Last year I released a record. Um, well it's online. I intended on releasing it in vinyl, but, uh, that's, uh, that's coming up still, but it is online. It's called meltdown. Um, I hope that most of people, most people have, uh, have seen this, this record, this record online here. Oh, so, nice. Uh, yeah, if I can if I can get it straight, but that's that's basically the record. It's been online for a while, uh, for a year. So it's um it's mostly a lot of my interpretation of what uh, punk rock, hardcore, or like uh, mostly a lot of rock and roll as well. Um, during the time of these riots that were happening out here, well, these protests, really not riots, they were protests. And also uh, at different moments in time last year, there were a lot of you know, different things happening that inspired that music. So um, it, was a, it was a good record to write. I put it out, there's 12 songs on it. Um, a lot of, like I said, a lot of rock and roll based music, but you know, punk rock. Um, so yeah, that's that's meltdown. Really, the uh, protests inspired um, uh, music that came out organically in about three weeks. Uh, I wrote it, uh, produced it. I played all the instruments on the record. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, I played everything uh, that you hear on the record, and I produced the record as well. Um, sang all the vocals that that came about simply because uh, <clears throat> you know we were in quarantine when that record was being written and so it was really difficult to connect with other artists at that point uh, being that we were all locked down and um, so and there were other things happening as well that I think were important cosmically like the grand conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn this I think I'm sensitive I've always been sensitive to energies and I think this uh, this kind of triggered something uh, as well as social issues like the climate change and little Greta Thunberg running around and really uh, punking up the youth, you know, and making them rise up and stand up against this system that's trying to destroy their future. So I saw that and I felt a lot of uh, energies from this time and it resulted in a record, a 12 song album called Meltdown that I put out. Uh, it's online everywhere. If you want to get it, you can go to israeljosephi.herenow.com forward slash and uh, you can get it there. Uh, it's available all over the place. And I'm an independent artist, so I would appreciate you guys picking up the record and enjoying it. It is fun. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it's it's killer, man. And, and, you know, I'm about to blow your mind here. I don't know if you knew this or not, but you were in Fireburn, and you guys put out your releases on uh, Closed Casket Activities, correct? Uh, that's correct, bro. That is correct. Closed Casket. Yeah, my first band excuse me, my second band, our our first release was the first release of Closed Casket Activities. We were called Death Blow. Oh, wow. That's awesome, yeah. bro. It was really yeah. awesome because, you know, they they have been such a great, great label and to see like all the the bands that they put out and to really kind of like propel their, uh, their careers. Like I love that Incendiary record and I was just jamming your guys' record the other day. Like, and it was a real treat to be able to see you guys in L.A. with um, with Brother Todd, you know, um, and he and I kind of connected over the the Krishna consciousness um, because he came up and just started talking to me. I I'm a terrible person. I don't have him on right now, but I had my neck beads on and uh, we just got to talking and and we're, you know, really, uh, really. You know, it, it was really interesting to see, you know, how much we had in common as far as that was concerned, you know, and 
and uh, I didn't I didn't know him beyond that, but you know I I've heard you know he was just a really fantastic individual, and and you know I I wish I could have seen I wish I could have seen you guys more, you know, with with him on the base. As with all of us, we've uh, all grown, and I think that Todd really grew as a human being. That was important to him as well as making creative music and uh, uh, doing creative uh, things, you know, um, working with a lot of artists that are really well known and, and changing how um, they hear music themselves and creating new music with them uh, as far as he feels it organically. Um, I think that Todd uh, relied on his spiritual power a lot to do this and his uh, spiritual energy that was transformed over the years, of course, like all of us, you know, we're all, <laughs> we were teenagers, you know what I mean? And now we're all like 50. So I'm going to be 51 in February. Oh, wow. And yeah, I'm gonna be, it's it's nuts. I can't believe it. You know, Well, happy up. early birthday for you. My, mine's actually coming up in a bit and I'm not going to be, uh, not going to be that, that, age but uh i'll be 39 um yeah, but it, it's awesome. starting to it's starting to you know get i don't want to say get to me but you know i feel like you know i i still want to have that same like that same punk ethos and same kind of mindset like even even getting older you know because i don't think that you know once you get involved in that that you know the the true the you know the true believers in that i don't think that ever leaves you in whatever capacity that you're in in life you know no it never does and that's that's what i was saying about todd that he relied on that um it helped it helped propel his need to do all right let's so let's you know in our in our in my interpretation and the interpretation of the people i've been around in this music business and and doing music man uh punk is um can, can be represented as a music of um, trying to pursue a certain type of uh, liberation for those who otherwise not would not be understood. Now, that's a fancy way of saying it's, it's rebel music, you know what I mean? And um, But in rebellion, you got to try and find out what kind of rebel you want to be. If you want to be like a Sith warrior in Star Wars, <laughs> and you be like a Jedi, understand? <laughs> And I hate to break it down to those, uh, you know, it's like a movie, you know, but realistically, there's some baseline understandings in that. There's a, the, the law of correspondence, which talks about every, the force is just really one thing. It's how you really use it. And I think that when you come to that understanding, when you understand the yin and yang and the force of, uh, that, that, that is between both of them, understand the yin is making a choice and the yang is making a choice and you too have to make these choices about who you want to be and life is always the winner because we can see that everything is promoting life and death is unseen so if you want to be kind of unseen in a certain way then okay you can live like a death kind of philosophy but if you want to live with continuous and rebirth and life and prosper in a certain kind of way, you understand? Then you have to live with a more positive version of the force. And I think that that's what punk really is, is, is in my ver in our understanding, me, Todd, Bad Brains, all the fireball people I've been chilling with, this understanding that it's for eventually a positive energy. And I think if any kind of negative energy comes into that, then that is their choice, but it's unnecessary in realistic terms. We have a very powerful instrument called music and the instruments we play. And true, the Bible say the players of instruments, the singers and the players of instruments shall be there. So we have to use these powers that we've been given, I think, to at least search for something higher. Notice I didn't say better nobody or teach anybody. Or, I just search for something more meditation higher in a meditation. That way a man and a woman and a people and a, and a, and a whole world can see it and maybe they might start glowing too, you know, light up the fire. Yeah, no, fire I, and 
fire burn, you know. Fire burn, have... yeah, absolutely. You know, and you know, it's yeah. interesting that you uh, analogized it to Star Wars, you know, because there's there's that dichotomy between you know the good and the evil, the the you know positive and and the negative, you know, and and I mean, I think it's really important to to understand that yes you know both those things exist but you know how do we how do we use our how do we use our energies and and how do we direct our efforts you know so that it's a, it's more of a it's more fruitful rather than than destructive you know and and i i noticed you were mentioning some some bible verses there which i think it would be a great segue because you know you and i have talked about rastafarianism before and so you know I, you briefly touched on this before in in our one of our earlier conversations, but you know, for the audience, how did you get involved in Rastafarianism, and and how do you feel like it enriches your life, and how do you feel like it would enrich and nourish the world as a whole? Well, Rastafari is uh, kind of just an extension of who you are as a person when you really find out what's going on with that you realize you actually are just uh, becoming who you always been. So you can't really become a Rasta. It's just, you have to listen to what Rastafari is saying and understand what the meaning is and understand how it relates to you and how it can help you. And then if you feel it, then those who feel it know it and they know what's, what, what the natural progression is after that. It can't really be something you dress up like a costume, you know, it have to be something, it's an inborn spirit, you know. And that spirit begins with empathy. Some sort of feeling when you say youth that the world is one, that, that the ants and the little creatures and the bigger creatures and I and I and the water and the, you have to understand these things first. This is like a first thing for a natural Rasta person is a first. Use you to understand certain things. Now, not every youth understand them things, you know, but certain youth can learn them things there. You know what I mean? All right, but most of the Rasta people is people already understand them thing there. A lot of them is people who get to learn them thing. You understand the difference? All right. So now, so you're born a man, a man or a woman who understand them thing there already. All right. So you're growing up in a world where teach you different. That that teaches you that 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 type of philosophy is 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 like a. There's many names for it. Polytheistic. You sound like you're a hippy dippy type. You're a to living in a spiritual dream world, you're a daydreamer, you live in a spiritual world. Okay, all of these tags because they want you to work. But what Rastafari is really saying is that there is a ultimate life force in the universe that man ultimately, you know, we say it manifested as his imperial majesty and pride last year, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings. But let's take it back to the foundation. You have an ultimate atom in the universe that is generating light, heat, and magnetism to all things. And in between your atoms, Aya, is light. So, the faster the light is moving, is the more light you will distribute. And the slower it is, the more you will look like a stone. And some light is fast moving, captured in a stone, which is like a diamond. And these are all symbols of people because we too are light. So the energy that manifests in Rastafari is to show you a few things now who you are as a human being manifesting as light. Seeing this is what light look like when it's going this, oscillating this fast. When it's oscillating a, a little faster, it looked like mist. It looked like a water, water. And then it also it looked like and fire, lava, heat, radiant light, red light, energy, on and on. But I and I look like light right now is who we are, light. And the stone look like light because that light is moving slow. You understand? So it's all the same thing. So Rasafara is saying that look at Haile Selassie in, on 
understand that this uh, kind of victory uh, that was achieved by him, both morally, spiritually, and actually physically, because he, he was, the, he talk about Game of Thrones. Haile Selassie was the winner of the Game of Thrones. That, that was the <laughs> biggest Game of Thrones ever in World War II. And I actually believe that uh, in my personal belief, The Hobbit, it has a lot to do with World War II and that Frodo and his friend represent England and France and the king is Haile Selassie and that England and France were to help the coming of the king and all. And he wrote that after World War II. So I actually believe that, that these stories are, are coming out to say, hey, this really happened in case you don't know. Uh, but this victory over uh, ev everything really is really a sign to show what is achievable through faith, through the belief in your heart to be who you are and that no one can say, you cannot be this. Remember Mussolini was saying, you cannot be this. We're gonna strike you down because you're saying you're this. So, but this is history and all right. So this is one value of Rastafari to show you the strength you can achieve, to show you the victory you can achieve, to show you um, faith, the power of faith and belief. Now I'm not saying this is all encompassing, but this is a very big part of the force to have faith, you understand, to have faith in who you are and to know yourself. All right, so one thing. But the next level now is Ali Selassie's connection to the Bible. People say, well, Rastafari, you're saying that Ali Selassie is Christ, is Jesus. And we say, yes, Ali Selassie is Jesus Christ, return as the king of kings, as the emperor, the, uh, not as the man, right? When you see the emperor, he is now the king of kings, right? He's no longer in the fulfilling the old scripture anymore. He fulfilled the old scripture already. He's, he came as Yeshua. His real name was Emmanuel. Emmanuel. But they called him Yeshua because he reminded them of Joshua in the Old Testament when he spoke. And they expected him to liberate them in that little town or in that little village side. And his, they called him Jesus, Yeshua, who is just the Greek is Jesus. But his name was Emmanuel, really. Manny. <laughs> What's up, Manny? The, the Lord is with us. That's what Emmanuel means, right? Yeah, yeah. If you met him, his real name that they got, that he was that they knew him by was Emmanuel, but they called him J Joshua, it was his nickname. We got to know him, but that's why he said in Revelation 2, when I return, I'm gonna come in my new name that no man will know except when I say it. And he mentions this new name that he'll come in, in Revelation, when he comes as the King of Kings and the, Lord, the conquering of the tribe of Judah, he'll come back in a new name. And this new name will be written on a white stone and this new name I shall reveal to the man who shall know it and no man will know it before I say it. And this is true about the name Haile Selassie because he sat on the throne uh, as Rastafari's birth name and uh, he took the title Haile Selassie, which means power of the Trinity. Now I, I, I jump ahead a little bit. What does this all mean? Jesus clearly says in the scriptures, now this is, okay, you can look at Jesus, you can look at uh, Krishna, right? You can look at the, Golden Lion of the Chinese. You can look at Quetzalcoatl. You can look at the Great Spirit. You can look all over the world in Africa, Europe, all over the world. They have a God. The Hindus call it the uh, the Kalki. And the Kalki come back to judge the world. And there is a king uh, known as Vishnu. Now in the Bible, they're telling you the same story because everybody met the same God. This is the secret, the I am. They met the I am just in different names and different clothing because he come in the jungle I am. You can't right. come like a desert I am, you come in the jungle I am. In the desert, you come like the desert I am. In the mountain and the stone mountains, you come like the stone mountain I am because you have to appeal to the people. It'd be mad if you come like a desert I am to the stone people, right? So the I am in the scriptures comes back. Jesus says, and when I say Jesus, keep in mind, I'm talking about all these. 
He says, when I come in the last, in before the last days, I'll return as a great king of kings. I will be sitting on a throne. And in the scriptures, he says, I'll be called the conquering line of the tribe of Judah. And I'll be fighting a war with 10 nations. Now I'm, I'm you know, uh, synopsizing the, the words in the scripture. I'll be fighting war with 10 nations. I'll have the lion of blood of David. I'll be the root of David, in the blood of David. I'll be called the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings. I'll, and uh, I'll, the Ark of the Covenant will be my presence. I'll reestablish the 12 tribes of Israel. That's revelation. And I'll fight a great war, flying, fly, flying in the cl clouds with power and glory, fighting these 10 nations and then establishing that, hey, I am the victor. Okay, I'm the prevailer, I'm the conquering lion. Okay, but back to Daniel in the Old Testament. He says, I beheld until the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. Now he's talking about the end times, right? The, the, when heaven and earth is rolled together like a scroll, right? It's heaven and earth is destroyed. So he's saying, I beheld until the thrones were cast down. Now, indeed, we can say that World War I and World War II, the thrones were cast down. That was literally an effort to kill all the kings of the earth, right? And all the, all the divine bloodlines. And he said, and the ancient of days did sit, having hair uh, like wool and skin like brass, as if it had burned in a fire. And, uh, and, and he talks about uh, one called the ancient of days. Jesus says in Matthew, uh, the queen of the south. Now, the queen of the south is the queen of Sheba that came to see Solomon that had a baby by her named Menelik seven to 800 to 900 BC, who began ruling in Ethiopia as the first Hebrew a long time after Moses, because the Ethiopians were Hebrews during Moses' time. We know that Moses married to an Ethiopian, but somewhere along the line, they fell off and started worshiping the sun. But when she met Solomon again, they took it back. And so for 700 years, they, this king began a line of kings 700 years before Jesus worshiping the Hebrew God again, like, you know, we're back on our stuff. But by Jesus, you know what happened, the religion. Okay. So uh, highly is the fulfillment of all of these prophecies of these religions sitting on this divine throne in the ancient land of Ethiopia, which we know is Abyssinia, which we know is the foundation of all, if not most of what, what happened, everything extended from there. And he sits in this ancient, most ancient of thrones and declares himself the king of kings, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, the Lord of Lords, the, you know. So uh, the fulfill, and Jesus says, the queen of the south, back to what I was saying, who is the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation because she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and believed him, and behold, the greater than Solomon is here, and y'all believe me not. So he said, in the last days, that you will see her, her rise up, but you can't see her rise up, but you certainly have seen her seed rise up, who was, who was his imperial majesty, her, her seed rose up in the judgment, in the great judgment. Uh, many other things, I'm stitching a cloth, as you can tell, I'm stitching a cloth to make a point. Now, if we look at all of this, this bowl of uh, candies I've presented, there's a pattern in here. And the pattern is the sweetness that is in all of it. And the sweetness is that he is the fulfillment of all of it. And that no man or no entity or no group could have fulfilled it before him because, simply because there was no world wars before him. There was no way to fly before him. There was no way to, uh, to, 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 for a man's face to be seen all over the planet and to, to be read about, to, his voice to be heard all over the planet. No way, there wasn't technology. So right before Selassie was born, which was in 1893, the light bulb was invented. Let there be light. You see the connection here? Yeah. So God cannot come to a dark earth. Let there be light. Now, the guy in Revel the man in Revelation, bro. All right, so that's one thing. So that's, that's Christ for 
prophecies fulfilled. But what is he saying? What is Christ saying? In Revelation, the one that's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is not the one who brings the final judgment, which is why we're still sitting here talking. He is God. That's Jehovah. That's the King. All right. Jesus is the lamb that take and he opens the book. Jesus is the lamb with the seven eyes, which means he sees all the continents. And the seven horns, which means he knows all the rulers and has influence in all the continents. That's the meaning of the seven eyes and the seven horns. But he takes the book from Selassie and goes with it. And he brings the judgment. The lamb brings the judgment. But Selassie fights the war because he is God. He's Jesus' father. He has to make, he has to spread the red carpet for him. But first, he has to fight the war. So Rastafari is saying, not only are you seeing Haile Selassie, the power of the Holy Trinity, you're looking at who traditionally the Hebrews called Jah. You're looking at the man that walked with Moses, that went, Adam, where are you? I can't find you. What have you done? Your brother's blood cries from the ground to me. You're looking at that dude. Look at that man. Moses, make me a cup of gold <laughs> and some golden spoons. Why? Because I eat, bro. I get hungry. We're going to sit up here talking about the law all day. I'm hungry, bro. I need to <laughs> make me a bowl and a table of covered it with gold so we can keep this clean. I don't want any dirty stuff in here. <laughs> all right? These are my dishes. So when I come down and sit on the ark, you know, I find it really interesting. Um, you know, you were talking about how essentially, you know, we're we're all seeing the same God, but it's you know almost like a different manifestation of it. I really started to appreciate different religions and spiritual walks when I ended up joining the Hare Krishnas. I my my understanding. I feel like was increased because, you know, there's so many connections and there's so many parallels. Like, for example, uh, Abraham and Sarai or Sarah in the Bible, the Vedic equivalent was Brahma and Saraswati. Yes. And then, you know, the, the name Jesus, uh, when they say Jesus Christ, Christ is a title. It's not his actual name. You and I know that. It's Krishna. We took that from Krishna. Krishna. That's right. It, it comes okay. from, yeah, Christos, the Sanskrit Christos, and then the Greek Christos, and then it went from there. And so I always found that it to be a really natural progression um, that we didn't, so we, it didn't. All right, make it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Oh no, 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 no! I was just saying that I, I found that to be so fascinating. And then, you know, the the early followers of Krishna were called Krishnians, and I'm like, that's really cool. You know, that's really interesting. And and I found that, you know, we're all kind of searching for the same thing. And and you know, I I had a friend one time that broke it down to me like this. He said, look, he said, if we think of God as a father. You know, and we think of ourselves as, you know, sons and, and daughters of God. Well, think about it like an earthly father. OK, if you have siblings, your siblings are not going to approach your earthly father the same way that you would. You know, like I have a sister and when we were growing up, she would be able to ask and ask for certain things, but she might do it in, in a different way. And I would have to do it in a different way, too. And that was analogous to people of different spiritual walks, you know, like everybody has a different way of framing things and looking at things. But but the idea is to know and to love God. And, and you know, Srila Prabhupada was talking about that when he came here. And I found that to be incredibly, incredibly yes, fascinating. It, it's it's totally important that we understand, first of all, that it's uh, it, it is an intermingling of philosophical understandings that got us to this point uh you know you know we must understand though 
monotheism had an original root, which never, which, which pursued its way through history, but never overshadowed or neither being overshadowed by uh, polytheism. Right, so that uh, polytheism represents a certain measure of freedom, as you were saying, uh, but what it also represents is disunity. It represents a disunified version of a unified God, which causes disruption in the minds of men. And when I say men, I mean men, and women, both man form, one have a womb, one is a man. Mm. So it causes the disruption of my, uh, the disunity of religion, the refusal to teach the principles that are really driving religion. For instance, most of the people you read about never existed. They're talking about the planets. Hmm. Elaborate, elaborate on that a little further. Because I've never heard that before. Most of the characters in history are versions of the sun moving through the zodiac. Oh, that would be like, you know, when they talk, is that like when they talk about like John, John the Baptist is the water bearer and then that's Analogous Aquarius. to Aquarius. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I have heard that. Jesus I'm sorry. did it because he wanted to die. Most of the people who did it before him faked their deaths. Like they went and hid in the pyramids for three days and they came back and went, I'm alive. What's up? Like <laughs> Marduk and, you know. Uh, just... Yeah. The, the, there's another one I'm trying to think that. Mithra. Oh, Mithra. Mithra. Yeah. 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 They, they fake their death, so they would come back out and be like, yeah, I'm the man, you know, I'm the king. Or if they're walking on water, they would find where the sun was on an auspicious day, mainly in the month of June, right as it was setting, and the sun would have that long reflection on the water, and they would go step into the water, and the people would say, the king. You walked on water. Through. It's amazing. Yeah. But Did Jesus, you when Yeshua, when he did it, he did it for real apparently, but what was really real was that he actually died. That was what's important about that story uh, is that he was the first one to, lit to legitimately and literally die, even by the Roman account, which was the spear of Longinus was plunged into his heart, which was the fact that they were gonna kill him. He was saying he was the king of the Jews and he was put on a cross as the sun cross, you know, the sun represents the sun, which is they say that's the real king uh, so you're going to die on the sun and they, they say, you're not going to pretend that you die. We're going to see if you're really the king. And they put a spear in his heart, which was the crucifixion is actually survivable. If someone gets you down on time, right. You break your bones and they, they hammer technically. You yeah. But if they get well, you down, a, a, on time, a lot of people don't realize that when, when people are crucified, when people are crucified, it's not through the hands, it's through the wrists through because the, wrist, the hands, you break yeah. That artery. Yeah. But if you don't break that artery, uh, it is it is technically survivable, and for at least a couple of hours or an hour or so, uh, they can get you down quickly. Uh, and especially if you bargain with these Roman soldiers, but they apparently did not want that for him. They were like, "You are going to die. You're gonna you're gonna we're gonna prove to these people that you're not any sort of king because we would have let the other kings hide and come out and parade around." So they killed him. They kill him for real. That's why. That's why it's important in that part of the scripture. It says his, his, his blood flowed like water, which means they hit that life blood. They hit that artery blood, and that part of it. They, they don't make a big deal out of that part of it anymore. But that part of it is one of the most crucial parts of the whole deal. That it. That he died. He literally died. Um. So he rose up. So this was. This is the key that you know. It's a disunity. I'm not talking about come together. And all of this, we talk about Christianity, but I'm a man that understands that we've all been, I agree with the concept that we've all been given a piece of the puzzle. It is a good way of looking at it. The puzzle's picture is an elephant, but
but the elephant at some point in time had to be cut up because people live all over this world and the picture was sliced up and each person was given a picture to remind them of what it is. But over the course of time, they forgot what the original picture was. And they only had this little piece. And now they go around teaching this piece is the ultimate uh, way to sacrifice. They don't quite know what the piece is. It's gray. It's kind of like there's like blue in it, but they, uh, this is it. And everyone thinks that. But what I think the most high is saying is, hey, bring those pieces together and I'll show you an elephant. I'll show you a, a beautiful field uh, that you all can benefit off of. And so the disunity is good. The, the, the separation is good. But it breeds a disunity that ultimately uh, causes man to be less spiritual. Now, most of the people are the sun and the planet. So if you're studying religion, understand you're studying astronomy and astrology. Sometimes you're studying history. But if you really want to study, then you got to study the force, which is the law of vibrations. The law, well, it's really the seven hermetic laws. And the seven hermetic co laws are really what a lot of the religions are based on. So if you can get that in yourself, if you can understand those things, then you'll be vibrating on what all those words are trying to say to you. They're really just seven or eight or nine or, you know, there's, there's a jumble of codes that are, that are hand-filled that if you just vibrate on these understandings about the ultimate understanding, which is why I'm talking about light in between the atoms, the light in between the atoms is either vibrating fast or vibrating slow. And the light between the atoms also unites everything. So if we understand this understanding that you are what you believe, that your, your thoughts are light, and there's light between these atoms, and so you can control this energy, and you are what you believe, and we each share that, then we can probably wake up in the matrix because we are all asleep. Uh, in the matrix in a matrix type scenario uh not in pods well maybe we will find out we're in pods but the pod is in our skull caps right our brains are asleep we must wake up and understand that we control our destiny by controlling the light within us and it's not about f false religions or costumes what it is is empathy understanding that all things start at the top and come down to the bottom and all things start at, uh, are at the bottom go to the top. The law of correspondence is really important as above so below. When we understand that we stop destroying the planet, we stop putting CO2 into the air, we stop allowing methane, we stop uh, homelessness, hunger, all of this stuff becomes real to us. If we don't understand the law, what the pyramid stands for, why they built those things in the desert, we think they're spaceships. No, they're symbols of the law of correspondence, the biggest thing you can understand in this world. And if you understand it, then you'll be right on with this universe. That's why those things are so imposing. And some achieve less and some achieve more and some achieve really great. The law of correspondence, as above, so below, as below, so above. That means everything is together. That means I won't let you suffer. I won't let you hurt because you are light and I am light. And although you, when we are light, having a, an experience as a human being. <laughs> I, I love that. That's amazing. Um, now, you, you know, one of the things um, that you and I had talked about before was the whole, you know, COVID situation that's going on in Los Angeles. I, I left Los Angeles a few months ago and, you know, I, I understand um, the struggle to kind of, you know, stay afloat there when you've got all sorts of uh, restrictions and impositions um, on, you know, your place of employment. For, for me personally, like I was, I was doing the acting thing out there and I, you know, they wanted me to get tested three times a day. And I was like, this just isn't worth it. And then I started doing this and I was like, I can do that somewhere else, you know? And, and so it, it got to be really frustrating for me. And I, I wanted you to, um, I wanted to see if you could possibly expound upon your experiences dealing with, you know, the, uh, you know, the city government and, and their restrictions as far as, you know, uh, you, you mentioned that you are a, 
apartment manager and that you uh, they're giving you all sorts of crap about that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not that they're giving me crap. It's that uh, what w the city's actually, you know, this is my city, and I, 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 I like LA. I love LA, as the song says. <laughs> uh, but w what my problem is is with this uh, mandate that uh, you know there's no evictions, and it it just leaves us with people who are unscrupulous in the buildings and willing to take advantage of that situation. And that's that's that that doesn't work out. But that's about it. This is a great city. Um, yeah. I've had a lot of uh, good times here. Hope to continue to do so. LA is awesome, but I do wish that something would be. Uh, I'm not saying get rid of the mandate, uh, the uh, mandate not to evict people. I think okay, people need housing, but to have us uh, be housing people who are dangerous, that is like whoa. Okay, well, I don't know. You know, I'm not trained for that really. Yeah. Uh, We've been doing a lot of psychological work lately with people, man. A lot of talking, a lot of talking people down. I'm like becoming like a really good at that. <laughs> yeah, that that I, I can only imagine, you know, because I, I, you know, dealing with, you know, I I wasn't a, I was never a manager, but I was really I knew the manager of my apartment complex really well, and you know, we had some really really kind of crazy situations, and I'm like, I don't know how you have. The headspace for that, how you are able to deal with that, but you know, it's ganja, you know, just smoke ganja and, and give <laughs> thanks to Ja, and also don't be a fool, don't go around acting like a fool. Try to use some wisdom and understand that people are people, and honestly, also you have to get over it. You have to be tough. You have to get over it. You have to wake up the next day and say, "Yo, man, Rastafari, I run things. You understand? I'm, I and I, <laughs> we not give up, Ja. We not get weary, man, and we just move forward and some urban gift dance, you know, and well, say hello, and people. How y'all doing today? You know, that's I mean? a, the sunshine, you know. Because that's a good segue. Inside, really, you want to show people the sunshine because sometimes you start that shine, start shine back on you, and you start go, wow, I feel, I feel better, smiling up the place. So somebody will hey, smile so much sometime, you know. It's like, well, we feel better sometime, you know. And I'm sure it make you feel better too. So, rest of our, you know, just say smile and I love and one love, you know, and and that's how I get through it, Bertrand. Just positive energy, man, because you can't let it get you down, man. You can't let it. Make you feel like you have a loss, but you know, and that's that's it, really, you know. Yeah, I and you know that's a good segue because you know you mentioned you know smoking ganja and whatnot. I I personally don't partake anymore. I have no issue with anybody that does, and you know, kind of my political stance is that hey, you know, I think it should be perfectly legal. I think everybody should be able to you know partake in it if they want to. How does the how does the consumption of ganja how does that tie in with rastafarianism like how well how the hebrews in the old days used to burn sacrifices to forgiveness of sins and um part of the sacrifice was the meat offering and the waving of the bread and they used to bring the herbs to burn uh, along with the meats and by themselves the plants of the field and the herb of the field and thing now, this was more of a limited sacrifice that went on in Nazareth because the Nazarites wasn't allowed to touch blood or go near dead bodies. And they also did not drink wine. So their sacrifice included more of the herbs of the field. That's why a lot of things people said, oh, what good can come out of Nazareth, you know? Because Nazareth is, oh, who are they, you know? Uh, they don't do the law properly. But this was their deal. They had to burn the earth. But the whole result is to make smoke. And why you want to make smoke is because Jehovah said, when I smell the sweet savor of the smoke, I'll remember Israel and forgive their sins. That's paraphrasing a few, few, few paragraphs in the Old Testament. But that used to be the reason why the chimneys were built. Well, Rastafari, I know now that we don't have a temple anymore. Sorrowful. But that's the way it is. And we don't have a Levite system. And the ark is in Ethiopia. So there's no way to keep that sacrament between Abraham and Jehovah anymore. It's done. We that that co the contract has either been made null or we are unable to keep it. So we're in trouble. Something is going on. We're in trouble. So Rastafari see Hali Selassie is the way to deal with this. That forgiveness is now the way. We don't sacrifice animals anymore. We just say, all right, I'm sorry, or I forgive you. And now also 
we have become the, temp the body of man have become the temple of God. Whereas that we use our lungs and our uh, money as buying a sacrament, which costs a sacrifice. It's money that's valuable, but we buy the herb, and then we use this chimney as our lungs to inhale the fire on the altar. As you see, like you have a little altar like this, right, in the temple, and you walk <laughs> nice. in the temple. And the, and the priests take the fire and then burn the temple and burn the altar. Go for it. <laughs> then this coming like my chimney. I love that. So that's, that's awesome. <laughs> no, that is the top of the chimney, the temple. Now the top of the chimney, the smoke part. Now I expect Rastafari Jawovia to smell that smoke that my sacrifice I just made for my own self, my money, whatever may I deal with, it's a sacrifice. And I expect Ja to respect that, to say, all right, Israel, I remember you, I smell it. And I remember you and I'll look out for you because I know you're trying. But you see, if I don't do that as a Rasta, I feel like it's not complete. You're not talking with, I'm not communing with God. So when you look at Rasta far, I smoke in Arab, you're not looking at a smoker. You're looking at a ritual, an ancient ritual that ha that goes on where Rasta make himself the temple. And he is now the smoke. Until we rebuild our temple, you know, until we put back up our temple, then, then they will have the smoke, the Levites. But right now we have to be every tribe. But I'm minus tribe of Joseph, but we have to be every tribe. Still, I have to have a Levi inside of me. And see, when, the Levi, when I want to smoke, the Levi come out and the <laughs> Levi burn it sacrament so joseph that. can be forgiven that's fantastic you know one of the things um i always like to talk about too is like you know what are you paying attention to as far as culturally like i know you and i had talked about uh john carpenter's the thing and how it's a masterpiece is there any like arts or culture or music that out there that anybody should be aware of or stuff that you have seen or listened to lately that that anybody might like you know, to tell you the truth, I think that pop music today, popular music today, is getting a little bit, um, too much away from making soul, music from the soul, and making music that is not based in perfection and absolute stringent perfection and that is one level of making music absolute stringent perfection there is no missed note there is no blurps there is no you know all the vocals are absolutely driven through machines that purify their sound and bring you know and they, the, the bands are just totally practiced to the point where and that's good but in a sense that's i don't like not for me it's right convention music is not for me it's too purified and it's almost like uh it's all it's it's almost like um okay you can have coconut water from the coconut you just break it open crack, 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 and then drink it straight or you can go to the 7-eleven and buy coconut inside the bottle where it's all nice and it's and not the same, you know, very I did, different. But I did that in India all the time, like where you would just go and, and, uh, you know, one of the guys on the streets would just, you know, 40 rupees or whatever, bust open a coconut. And it's, it's completely different from getting it at like 7-Eleven where you've got all these, you know, additives and, and stuff like that in there. I love it. Yes, King. Man, work is calling, brother. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. Um, and you know thanks so much um i'm gonna post a link to your album here in the uh in the actual um video description but once again israel joseph man it's been a real pleasure thank you so much for coming yeah, can on i just say um uh on um coming off the end of this that um yeah check out meltdown at, at uh, israel joseph i dot here now dot com forward slash um and also on Bandcamp as well 
Uh, but I do have a new record I'm working on and that is going to be coming out hopefully soon or I might just go with a single uh, first uh, and uh, to offer a single first this time around instead of dropping a, an entire record. Um, so look out for that. Look out for a lot more works coming. I have a, a poetry book that I'm going to be working on and a book, an actual book, a couple books that I'm trying to put together, ideas that I have. Um, there's uh, hopefully trying to work with some other bands on some other things as well, not just my music, but um, look out for the new record. Please go follow me on YouTube. I can use some YouTube followers as well. I will okay. absolutely do that. And brother, I appreciate you so much for coming in. Once again, uh, click on that subscribe button. Click on the bell for notifications. Like, comment, and share. Israel Joseph, namaste. Job bless, namaste. Brother. Rastafari. <laughs> Alistair, blessings to all the people out in the world. Seeing guidance and protection. <laughs> Love it. Thanks, brother.